Welcome back everyone to the 2021 uh, annual conference of Western Field Ornithologists. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Harper who will be uh, moderating the photo ID panel this evening. Uh, Ed was born in Montana where he developed his interest in birds at an early age. And anyone who spends any time with him now quickly learns of his love for Montana and its avifauna. Ed taught mathematics and field ornithology at American River College for many years. He's been active as president of Sacramento Audubon Society and as a board member with Western Field Ornithologists. I first encountered Ed when he was uh, giving presentations for the Central Valley Bird Club at our annual Central Valley Bird Symposium. And I've attended probably somewhere between 20 and 25 photo ID panels uh, given by Ed either at the Central Valley Bird Symposium or at Western Field Ornithologist meeting. So uh, to me, he occupies a position similar to that of Alex Trebek in Jeopardy. And so without further ado, I introduce the Alex Trebek of the photo ID panel, Ed Harper. Say hi. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> We're trying to get all organized right here. This is going to be a little different this year, being virtual, but I think we'll be able to do it. I think I'm going to have to share screen next. We're trying to get started on this. So, Jennifer, I think that's what you want me to do, right? Share screen? Uh, why don't you introduce your panel first? Oh, okay. Um, okay, let's uh, take a look at the panel here. First of all, um, we're, everybody knows, of course, John Dunn, president of WFO. And uh, he's always been on these committees, always has this encyclopedic uh, knowledge about uh, birds of North America here. Also, we have Kimball Garrett, who is uh, the uh, curator at uh, the Los Angeles uh, Museum of Natural History. He's been on the panel many times. Uh, he has the specialist of a museum manager. He can look at these different plumages and tell you exactly uh, everything about their uh, age and uh, um, all these things that we really need for this photo ID. And then there's Joe Merlin. And Joe has been a famous figure in the Bay Area here. He's done classes for many years for Golden Gate Audubon and uh, for the colleges there in the uh, Bay Area. And he's been on the committee before too. And um, he gives a very exact and concise description of these birds. And new to our committee this year um, will be Andrew Gutenberg from Bozeman, Montana, my hometown. Andrew is a, an outstanding artist. You're gonna see more and more of this young man as time goes on. I remember meeting Andy when he still couldn't even drive and having watched him grow up into be an excellent birder and an outstanding artist. And I'm really thrilled that he can be with us and add his artistic uh, blend to this uh, meeting here. So that's my committee and we're ready to go. Share screen. I'll share a screen here. Oh, that one right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's see if we can get this off and running here. Okay. Okay, we'll try to get this all going here. Well, there we are. I think I can get it now if I do it here. Okay. So just double check. Can everybody see it? All right. Can everybody see this uh, image right now? Yes, I can see it. But I can see. I, I, are you showing it in a presentation view, or are you showing it just on on your regular screen? Regular screen right now. Yeah, I, I think it's presentation view. Because I, I can see that you've got some some words, some file names on the side. Um, if, if this is a PowerPoint. You should start the presentation. Uh, no. Oh, it's not a PowerPoint then. No. Can, okay, you're just showing the actual pictures from the file. And right. It's, mm -hmm. And it's fine. Okay. You're looking great. Okay, as long as you can see this. Mm -hmm. Now, um, those of <clears> you <throat> that went to the um, WFO meeting in Billings in uh, 2015 might have seen views like this. This is a scene from Montana. And I just, uh, I'm sorry <laughs> that we're not virtual this year. I mean, that we're not uh, having to do this. Uh, I'm sorry we're having to do this as virtual this year because it's so much fun to see everybody out in the field and uh, share all these good experiences. So you might even recognize some of these WFO people here. So I miss you all, and I'm uh, looking forward to next year when we can all be together again in the field. 
just a few caveats about uh, the program tonight. Um, I'm going to have you a lot of have a lot of birds for you to, ident to identify, but uh, I'm going to be nice to you and say they're only going to be in the region. Uh, birds have been seen in the region that WFO covers. We're not in Florida or Georgia where this Bachman's uh, sparrow might be observed, so you can just put those aside, and we'll be concentrating on the uh, birds of the West. Um, this is not particularly a Western bird, but it occurs uh, as a vagrant. And I'm going to start my um, uh, slides with one through five. Now, one's going to be a fairly easy one so that everybody can kind of feel like they're getting something. Uh, they will learn something about each of these birds, even if they're, they're fairly straightforward. So this might be a number one, this uh, female uh, black-throated blue warbler. But then I'll go through two, three, four, and finally end up with five. Now, five will be a little tougher. And so that'll give us something to discuss. So we only have about an hour to do this. So let's get started. Unless you have a question right now. So we're looking out here at this uh, scene right now. And it uh, looks like good hawk country. So we're going to start with hawks. I'm going to show you five hawks in a row. And then this is number two, number three. I'm not seeing any hawks at all. I just see a, a, a grassy field that might have a Baird sparrow or something in the oh, background. Oh, you don't see? No, all I see is a sunset. Oh, my gosh. This is not going through that way then, huh? Okay. So um, I <clears throat> let's um, stop your screen share for a second. Okay. And I'll go back to, to the beginning. Um, just uh, stop screen share. I'm gonna, or I'll, I'll actually stop your, your sharing. I'm going to stop it for you. Okay. So now I want you to go back to share screen. All right. And then on that, it should give you some um, choices of what you want to share. Um, you want to share the presentation that you have prepared for tonight. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can find it on here. I can find it this way. Whoops. You might have to browse for it. Yeah. Okay. I'll Okay, I think this is going to be it. Well, okay, you are sharing your screen now. Uh -huh. And um, I can see that you've got the file there. It says virtual WFO bird ID. Do you try, try clicking on that? Yes, it is virtual okay. WFO bird okay. ID. All right, now let's try advancing um, your slide to the next one. Can you do that? Okay, let's see. There All you right. go. Okay. Uh, can everyone see the picture of all the birders birding? Yes. Yes, okay. that shows up now. All right. Looks like it's working. Okay. There we are now. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Jennifer. So here I was rattling away about all these things, talking about a backman sparrow that uh, we won't be having in this discussion, talking about uh, going through uh, birds one through five, one being a fairly straightforward forward one, like this uh, uh, female black-throated blue to a more difficult black-throated blue warbler. And now we're ready to start our program here with uh, raptors here. I'm gonna go with the series like, oh, maybe it'll be sparrows, maybe it'll be uh, raptors, maybe warblers, sometimes just a potpourri, but here we go. And I'll show you one through five. Here we are, number one. Everybody see that? Two, three, four, no, nope. Kimball, you haven't seen it? I finally see number one. Wow. I'm seeing them, so I might be an right, now, now internet they're... connection issue. Yeah, it sounds I, like I, it's an internet I'm seeing everything. I don't, I don't see Andrew even here. <laughs> Joe, are you seeing everything? Yeah, I see everything. Okay. And this is number Andrew. five? I don't know what anything is, but I see them. <laughs> okay. So we're going to back down. We'll start with number one. If everybody can get back to number one, here we are. Yeah, I thought this might be a Swainson's hawk. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's what I think it is. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what morph it is, but uh, it looks to me like it's got uh, pale uh, underwing coverts especially along the leading edge. First thing I look at is the leading edge of the wing to see if it's dark and then it's probably a red tail. If not, I'm looking for something else. I'm looking at the tail banding and I'm seeing really narrow, narrow tail bands and then a broad terminal band, the end of the tail. Um, 
So it looks pretty long wing to me. And um, this is probably from Montana. So I'm guessing it's a, it's a Swainson's hawk. And you are correct, Joe. This was taken April 3rd in Solano County, California. Number two. Who wants to jump on this one? Well, I think it's a dark morph bird, and this one could be a red tail. It seems to have some red in the tail, but uh, other than that, I give up on these dark morph birds. <laughs> it looks like a red tail on shape to me. Um, shorter winged, a little broader wing than the Swainson hawk, and more pointed. Um, I can't tell what color is in the tail, so I suppose it could even be whitish and could be a Harlan sock um, out of the Northwest or a dark morph red tail. Um, looks like an adult, that broad, dark trailing edge and not as pointy in the wing. Looks kind of big build like a red tail. Yeah, I was gonna mention that between the, the curved trailing edge of the wing and the uh, size of the bill, um, those are like two things that stand out pretty immediately of uh, the structural cues that are different from the Swainson's in the last photo that are kind of superficially <clears throat> similar. Well, you're all right. I, I thought this to be a dark morph uh, red tail hawk photographed it on March 15th in Modoc County near Alturas, California. Number three. Well, I can take a stab at this one. Um, I'm seeing a very long tail and short rounded wings that uh, would make this one a, an occipiter. Um, it does kind of look capped, which would, if you just focus on that, I think would might, it might lead you towards uh, a Cooper's hawk, but I think that the wings are a little too short and curved forward and the, uh, the tail seems to be um, fairly uniform length and uh, each feather. And that, that makes me think it's probably a sharp shin. I'm holding up a magnifying glass to this thing and I think it's an adult. It looks like it has um, barring, you know, sort of smudgy barring across the entire underparts instead of streaks. Um, so I agree it's an exhibitor. And I guess I agree it's, a, it's a sh probably a sharp shin talk. One of the things to look for is if you draw a line across the leading edge of the wings, does the head project out beyond that line? And it doesn't, it seems to be tucked in. Next thing I look for is the, the tail formula. The um, outermost tail feather, uh, what is that, R6, uh, is about the same length as the next adjacent tail feather. So that's a square corner tail. Um, so that's better for sharp shinned hawk than it is for, um, for a Cooper's hawk. So that's what I think. Good points, guys. Didn't you? Yeah, it? I would just. Yes. I would just add the caution that beware of the apparent difference of tail shape when the tail spread like that, mm -hmm. versus if you were to see the per bird perched with the tail not spread. So what Joe suggests is it's very helpful to look at the relative lengths rather than just the general impression is that rounded or or not. Right. I because that definitely is rounded. <laughs> it's a curve mm -hmm. when it's fanned out like that. But relatively, they're they're yeah, they would be square if it was folded. If it wasn't curved, it would have to be notched. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, the tail feathers are all the same length, so it's definitely going to end up looking rounded when you're done. When as right. it's, as it's fanned. I would have left this mm -hmm. bird unidentified if I was in the field. The head projection looks kind of intermediate to me, not sort of pushed into the body, but not really long enough for a Cooper's. So. Hopefully, while I was struggling with the ID, I'm looking at the picture and the outer retrix has a different, the, the band is thinner. I'm just wondering if that's an, uh, a retained or hasn't molted its last R6 yet. <clears throat> that's from a younger stage. I just see a different pattern there than the other tail feathers, which then makes me wonder about the shape if it's a juvenile tail feather. Right, because the juveniles have longer tails than the adults do. Hmm. That's a great observation. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, uh, you got it right as far as Sharp Shin Hawk is concerned, uh, July 8th in Ennis, Montana. I judged this to be an adult bird when I uh, saw it. Uh, and Peter Pyle flashed up that R6 differs 
and Peter can clarify, I don't want to, but and and all from the other retroces, I guess he meaning adults. So maybe there's not a, maybe the R6 is a typical adult tail feather. Well, okay, let's keep moving on. We didn't have an hour. Here's number four. <laughs> I should probably chime in here since uh, I haven't taken the leap. And so I think it's, it's worthwhile stepping back and just thinking about the totality of how you identify a bird. First of all, you know where you are and when it is, and you're able to watch things like behavior and perhaps hear vocalizations. And that makes photo ID, I think, more difficult. So here the process is very simple. You take a screen grab, you send it to Merlin, and Merlin tells you what the bird is. Um, may, may not tell you correctly, but it tells you what the bird is. So um, I'm just kidding. I would not advocate that, but <laughs> we're seeing a what looks like a, a young bootio here. And I, I've got to admit to making a lot of flubs with, with bootio hawks. Um, and one thing I particularly have trouble with sometimes is uh, young broad-winged hawks versus young Swainson's hawks, even though once you apply shape characters and look at them more carefully, they're pretty easily told apart. But just at a glance, just the way the thick mailers, the streaking and so on. Um, this bird, nothing, nothing about this bird Swainson's hawk to me. It looks to me like a young broad-winged hawk, very, very white underwings with, with dark primary tips, um, pretty ratty looking tail with um, moderately fine barring a, a thick, thick mailer. Uh, you can't see the rest of the chest streaking pattern, but everything I'm looking at here looks to me like a young uh, broad-winged hawk. Broad-winged hawk it is. It was photographed on the 27th of May, uh, Malta, Montana. You guys are doing great. Let's go for the last one, number five. <laughs> uh, I'll just say from the get-go, uh, a, a dark morph ferruginous or a dark morph rough leg, I think the tail pattern favors ferruge um, and maybe the primary pattern and perhaps the wing shape, but that's a, a gut call. That's my, that's my rough guess, dark morph ferruge, but it could be a rough leg. Does it have uh, feathering on its tarsus? It does. It looks like the tarsus mm -hmm. is fairly hidden. You can't tell. Yeah. It does seem like it has a very burly chest and shoulders, um, which that could definitely just be the angle that we're seeing it at. But um, I feel like if it was white and red and gray, it would be just fine for a, for a ferruginous. Um, but yeah, that's also just kind of a gut feeling. And I'm honestly not sure how to separate it from a uh, rough leg in this, in this position with what we can see. Well, the, the I tail think in general, a dark rough leg might look, in general, a dark rough leg might look a little bit blacker. I'm kind of mm -hmm. seeing some really dark gray brown here, but there could be a lot of overlap there. So I would lean toward ferruginous. Um, <clears throat> the, the tail looks mostly dark to me. I think I'm seeing pale on the upper tail coverts. I don't know. Well, admittedly, this is the tough one. This is why it's the number five. Uh, of course, in real life, you usually see the head sometime, things like that, you know, the date, you know where you are. We're in Modoc County, it's on the 15th of March. That might help us a little bit. Um, so in Northeastern California. And um, it's got a, <laughs> I, I was just thinking that it doesn't really show very much white out here, like you would expect on a fruge. The tail looked like pretty dark there. I, uh, it was a rough-legged hawk that we uh, photographed there on the 15th of March, rough-legged hawk. But raptors are tough. They're one of the toughest. That's why we like to go through them with this uh, group. Well, let's take a different group of birds this time and uh, get out our binoculars and maybe go looking at warblers. Here's number one. Here's number two. I hope you're all keeping up with this on your own computers. Sometimes there's a lag. Number three. Lag. 
leg, I'm sorry. Here's number four. If there's too much of a lag, we may just dispense doing the uh, initial look. Everybody on number five yet? Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to uh, number one. That should uh, be a nice one for us, for us to start with here. Well, it's a, a bright yellow bird with a gray head and what appears to be a complete eye ring. At least it's connected around the back. So th that suggested to me that it was a, a Nashville warbler. Uh, there is always the possibility of Connecticut warbler, which would be, I think, a plumper bird with bright pink feet. Um, so I'm going to stick with Nashville warbler based on that. Yeah, the yellow is a bit too extensive for uh, Virginia's and the back is too greenish. Yeah. Nashville. Okay, that was number one. I think most people would get that. I always like the white between the legs on them as well. Number where, two. Where was it taken, Ed? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this National Warbler was photographed in Tahama County up by uh, Red Bluff on the 29th of April. So Calaveras Warbler, <laughs> which is pretty distinct from the nominate and failed by one boat to be split. Hmm. So don't don't just push them out of mind. A change of one vote, everyone would be talking about Calaveras warbling and how to oh, tell wow. it. Is, is there a difference in the amount of white in the undertail and the uh, between the legs between those two? Not that I know of. The, the rump's a little brighter on um, Ridgeway. On Calaveras. I, yeah, and the tail's longer. Other marks include song and chip note, which are obviously useless here. Yeah. They're really, and they tail, tail bob. So if there was a uh, footage of it, that would help see how it acts. So Calaveras tail bobs and and like a Virginia and chips like a Virginia's. Yeah, and genetically it might be closer to Virginia's. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Number two. Well, well I'll just I'll, oh, go ahead, John. So I was just going to say that any warbler with bright yellow feet, uh, several warblers have it, but in a combination with the very streaked back and the uh, bold wing bars. Um, and you can look and see it has very long under tail cover. It's very long primary projection, a very short tail, indicative of a long distance migrant. This is a um, spring female a black ball warbler, I think. They vary in color. Some are, aren't as greenish as that above. Well, good, good remarks there on that. Uh, we'll keep moving here to get through as many as we can here tonight. Uh, yeah, this was uh, photographed in northeastern Montana near Hinsdale uh, in spring migration, and it was the date of 27 May, May 27th. Number three. That would be a Tennessee warbler, I think. Nice black line through the eye, yellow supercilium, pretty uh, nice green back and yellow on the throat. And, uh, or is it an orange crown? No, I think it's a Tennessee warbler. Orange crown warblers usually don't have that strong an eye line. And uh, if I look carefully, the undertail coverts that are just sort of hidden there behind the branch are white. There's a little bit of yellow across the vent area, uh, but that's fine for Tennessee warbler. Um, I don't think it's got wing bars, but I can't really tell that. I'm assuming it doesn't. It has a very fine, thin bill, which is uh, suggestive also of that group of warblers. That's what I think anyway. I'll just add. Notice also the tail is very short. You can see the undertail covers basically reaching almost the notch at the tip of the tail, which is a good mark. Certainly against orange crown warbler, which has a lot of long, dark tail beyond the under tail covers. Number, I see a question in the chat. Number two was a black pole warbler. So we're back to here. And in many ways, this is probably more similar to a potential vagrant Philoscopus warbler from the old world in general plumage than to any other new world warbler. But uh, this is a perfectly fine Tennessee warbler. Yeah, I was gonna bring that up. Um, I don't know if I could tell from this photo the difference between this bird and say a wood warbler, um, which is has a yellow eyebrow and 
and throat and uh, is pretty greenish above and white belly. Um, I guess bill shape, maybe. Um, bill shape. And this Tennessee has some white in the tail, a little bit in the outer tail feathers, which oh, okay. many have. And the wood warbler <clears throat> is an old world species, has very long wings, but of course, we can't tell that from here. And I don't think it has, it, it, it's yellow on the throat and breast and then goes pure white. There's yeah, not this, a band behind the legs. Okay. And this Tennessee warbler was photographed uh, October 5th <clears throat> in uh, Great Falls, Montana, fall migrant. Here's number four. Well, I'll just say that uh, if I saw this photo from across the room, I would think it was a female blackbird. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's got some some missing feathers around the bill, but it looks enormous. Um, or maybe it's just a strange angle. Mm -hmm. It's definitely well, thought, missing some feathers there. Yeah. My thought Go was ahead, yellow, or yellow rump, just because yeah, it looks like one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <out of bones. laughs> One thing I learned, this is clearly a, an immature, um, I wouldn't, I guess an Audubon's, I can't see much of a supercilium, but one thing that's a little alarming is that yellow rumps in juvenile plumage, and they will migrate, don't have a yellow rump. It has a streaked rump with no trace of yellow in it, but the wings, the tertials are covering up the rump, so you can't really tell. <clears throat> but anyway, I think it's an Audubon's yellow rump warbler. And you are correct. One thing about yellow rump warblers, and yellow rumps as opposed to some other of the C. topica warblers, is the tail kind of flares out. You can see, it, even though it's slightly spread, the tail shape's a little different from, say, the birds in the Townsend's black throated green group. It's a little bit uh, broader toward the tip, and this seems to have those broad, rounded outer tail feathers. You can see a touch of white there. So, other than the angle, the missing feathers, and the fact you can't see the yellow rump. Uh, this all fits Audubon's warbler quite well. Um, one thing about the messed up look right here is it was feeding on eucalyptus uh, flowers and they get all, the feathers get really messed up because of the sap and all that of those eucalyptus uh, flowers. So this was uh, photographed uh, on the 23rd of March in um, Sacramento County. Number five. On the 23rd of March, would that have been a bird of the year, a juvenile? A bird that no. had just recently hatched? No. No. So Second it's an adult. Bird. It's an adult. Well, it's a, well, a, lot, it's of, a, a lot of best ones warblers second year. are not advanced. Second year warblers are not. <laughs> it was just a... a a weird looking warbler, <laughs> as I thought. Well, it'd be a good one for a quiz. Here we are, number four, five. Uh, might be a black throated green. That's my vote. Yeah, unless uh, there's some hybrid that you're uh, tricking us with here and we can't see the face pattern very well. Um, I think black throated green. Is well, why, are we, this one. why are we not seeing yellow? Why are we not seeing yellow in the vent area? Overexposed, a little with the white. Yeah, that's the side to... But the back's way too green for a hermit. Yeah, I mean, there's no, yeah, there's no strong cheek patch unless you're getting into some hybrid, but I would uh, normally expect to see a yellow band in the vent area on a black-throated green. It looks like feathers might Shirt be missing in the way. vent area. I think that's just the, gap between the feather tracts. And it might be an SY looks worn tail spring bird where the yellow isn't as fresh uh, plumaged or mm -hmm. as contrasty. I, I would I would support black throated green. So how would you rule out how would you rule out Townsend's hermit hybrid? Looks pretty unstreaked underneath given the lack of and that limey Which could green, be a hermit contribution too. That limey green color on the <clears> back, <throat> perfect for black throated green. The back is unstreaked as well. Yeah. 
Well, this is a pho photographed uh, on the 27th of May in northeastern Montana, uh, around the town of Hinsdale, Milk River Park. And uh, got a lot of shots of this. It was a female black-throated green warbler. And my state nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Andrew. I forgot about that. <laughs> this bird was very cooperative. Took must have oh, twenty. I'm glad to hear it. it. <laughs> okay, but this one was a tough one to ID. I thought so. Here we go. We'll keep moving on. So you can see my love affair I have with Montana, and that gets us ready for sparrows, I guess. So little brown birds. Here's number one. Or does it do any good to go through five, one through five the way that there's a lag on this? Let, let's save some time. Let's just go through one at a time. Here's number one. It's supposed to be the easy one. A long, five. A long-tailed sparrow yeah. with a small bill. Uh, it hits me immediately as Spazella. And then I look at the face pattern and it, there's the dark line, postocular line does not extend through the lowers. So it has a blank look in front of the eye. So it's brewers are clay colored and a very fine streaked crown without a broader lateral crown stripe. Um, postocular line is kind of thin. There's no real gray collar. So I don't think it's a clay colored. This looks perfect to me as a brewer's sparrow. I don't, I don't see any sign of a median crown stripe, which clay colored has. As to what subspecies it is, Diverneri or Nominate Breweri, after reading the birding article, I looked at the pictures and thought they looked identical. So uh, <laughs> also look at the, another mark chipping lax is the uh, mustachial streak at the bottom of the auricular chipping is, is plain there. Um, and it's probably in the spring, so if it was a chipping, it would have a red cap, a red crown. So Brewers. Photographed on the 14th of uh, March, Sacramento County. <clears throat> Number two. I'd call that one a, a lark sparrow, uh, just based on the, what I see of the reddish lateral crown stripes. I don't know, the crown is, the uh, supercilium is kind of buffy, and there's some black through the eye. But um, I think I see some white in the outer tail feathers. I see no streaking, no obvious streaking on the under uh, parts and the uh, bold white wing bar. Um, but the, the head pattern is always the first thing that knocks you out on a, on a lark sparrow. And unless I'm totally misjudging what I'm seeing here, that's, that's my first guess. Yeah, I agree. I think lark sparrow. That um, touch of white. Oh, sorry, Campbell. Um, as an artist, uh, I'm sorry, I, I was just gonna say that touch of white at the base. Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, as an artist, the first thing that I put down on an illustration is the base color. And I think a lark sparrow has a pretty distinctive kind of creamy clay gray tan uh, that's very smooth um, um, and uniform across most of the bird and uh, except the belly and, and face. And I'm seeing that here. I think it's a just, I, I guess it's just more of an impression than a field mark, but um, it looks like the color of a lark sparrow to me. Kimball, did you want to talk about the white at the base of the primaries? Yeah, I, I was just going to mention that touch of white at the base of the primaries is something lark sparrows show and most other sparrows don't. So I don't know if it's diagnostic, but it certainly suggests lark sparrow to me. Well, lark sparrow it is. Uh photographed June 24th in uh, Rosebud County, uh, Montana. Here we go with uh, number four, I believe. Or number three, I think. More than a touch of white in the tail. Yep. <laughs> I'll start on this one. Just uh, I'm seeing a bird that essentially looks like it has a white tail. So either something weird's going on or it's the one sparrow genus that has extensive white in the tail, which is of course the genus Junko. Um, I'm trying to think exactly where you are here. So what subspecies we're gonna be dealing with, but um, unless I'm, uh, it looks a little odd in many respects, but what I'm seeing suggests to me a juvenile Junko still heavily streaked below. Um, not sure about the touch of white on the wing coverts here. 
bill's a bit pinkish, head's quite gray. Um, depending on where we are, it could be one of many subspecies, or I could be way off and it could be a leucistic something else with a lot of white in the tail. Juvenile chunko. Any other? They all look pretty juvenile plumage. Yeah, one but, time somebody called right. up to report a Vesper sparrow in a flock of juncos um, in Berkeley where Vesper sparrows don't occur. And Vesper sparrows do have a uh, white on the underside of the tail. They're, they're pretty much completely white also. The eye ring might also suggest a possibility of a Vesper sparrow, but the color is way off and the amount of the, the distribution of streaks on the underparts. I think it's a juvenile junco. Uh, I, I'd like to say it was a white winged, but I sure don't know that. It also well, has a pretty were... long, shallow bill, too, as compared to a Vesper Sparrow. Good point. And we were in the Sierra. We're up near Wrights Lake, El Dorado County, not far from Tahoe. And this was on the first day of September. This uh, <coughs> young uh, dark eye jungle. Thurberi. And here's another one for us here, number four of the series. Deja vu. <laughs> right. Uh -huh, yes. <laughs> that bill is so tiny. It's another burr sparrow. I guess that's going to tell us it was Taverneri because he was at Timberline. No. But the crown, <laughs> very fine streaks like a burr's. Pale ores. I'll also notice the white ash eye ring. If that tells us it was a clay color, I'll disagree. Yeah, they... Um... The, the, the conflict bird here might be field sparrow, which has a bold white eye ring and a, and a, a pink bill, which I think I'm seeing on this uh, also. It's not a field sparrow, I, I don't think. It, it doesn't have the rusty coloration on the sides of the breast. Now this uh, Brewer sparrow was photographed on September 9th, Craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho. You guys nailed it very well. Well, right. Just look different than the other brewers. So just trying to be a little tricky there. Here's the last one of the series. <laughs> That's a mess. <laughs> a long spur. Yes. And it's got a thick bill. So we could say it has, it's a thick billed long spur, lowercase t. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it is a, uh, because of the very thick bill that's pinkish, I think it's a juvenile McCowns. You know, any other comments? Well, you can see the black uh, feathering at the on the bases of the underparts. So, like the, they're all veiled with uh, with grayish white, and uh, I think uh, as it molts into breeding plumage, those pale tips wear off, and uh, and the black. That's how the thing gets the black uh, belly the black breast and belly. McCown's doesn't have a black belly. Oh, it doesn't. That's the what color. am I thinking it's of? Chestnut small chest collar. spot. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Never mind. But what they do have is a, a dark mailer, which even though this is the wrong age, it seems, it, it's showing a, a hint of that mailer that would develop in an alternate adult male. And that kind of blankish face that sometimes strikes you as sort of a house pharaoh-like pattern. Very good, you guys, on McCown's long spur, or thick bill long spur, if you wish to call it that now. Thick bill. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the general audience out there, if you got that one right, give yourself two points, because that was one of the tougher ones. That was number five. And not a sparrow. Uh -huh. it, it's right. It's not a sparrow. And Rincophanes, is, it's in a monotypic genus, which refers to the bill, a snout-like bill. Hence which we thought was an inspired new English name, but the majority disagrees. And this well, in this case, the thick bill is really what helps you actually know what it is. So I think the name makes enough sense for this one. <laughs> and photographed, like I said, the 19th of June near uh, Judith Gap, uh, Montana. Oka Road, Andrew. All right, let's see what we can do next here. Well, let's see. Here's number one. We're going to go through some sandpipers, perhaps. Let's see what we have here with number one. Hmm. 
Oh, stopping here. I see long primary projection. And it says Calidris Sandpiper. So that kind of gets us down if we're not dealing with a couple weird vagrants to pretty much Bairds and White Rump. My, my gut feeling when it flashed up was Bairds, but why does it look so white? Um, and I don't know if that's lighting or what. Um, but of course the other option would be White Rump, which this bird I don't know, but I'm not seeing. Uh, why isn't this I'll, I'll a Sanderling? Let's take it from there. Well, why yeah, isn't my it impression a Sanderling? So do I. That's my vote. Can't okay. tell what egg behind toe, but the the pattern on the that scapula. Explains why, that explains why I look so white. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can, I guess I never noticed the long primary. Yeah. Look under the the um, median coverage. You can see sort of some blackish yeah. there, like a sanderling. And and right. the way the scapulars are with the dark sort of pinching off the tip so that you get these twin areas of pale on either side of the scapulars is sanderling like. I mean, I looked at the head and thought, well, the head looks kind of semi-palmated sandpiper like, but the primary projection is of course too long. Um, and uh, maybe it well, does like- in the desert, I don't see. <laughs> yeah, good, good point. Now I know why it looks so white. And so it's probably I, I, in the surf there too. And, and I'm just to make sure that everybody's clear. Uh, this is a juvenile, right? Yes. Right. All right. This Caledris alba or Sanderlene was uh, photographed on the 10th of September in Winters, California, the sewage ponds. Mm -hmm. Number two. Might be a leaf sandpiper. Agreed. Breeding adult, I guess. Alternate yep. adult. Overall, um, very speckly brown, very warm colored, short wings, and then the bill with that really strong droop at the tip where it thins out really finely. Right. Slightly curved. Another caution is that the people. It's very hard to judge size on a lone bird. So I've seen people see a bird like this with the kind of droopy bill streaks across the chest, not factoring in wing, wing shape and thinking pectoral sandpiper on a bird like right. this. Obviously they're very different in size, but that can be very hard to judge sometimes on a lone bird. But I certainly agree this is a least sandpiper, unless you tell me it's a sanderling. <laughs> Well, we covered up the legs in this one, so John wouldn't have to remark about leg color not being a useful mark. <laughs> <laughs> and John, you're always good at the uh, date. What, what, what month do you think this is? April. April 17th. Right on, John. Yolo Basin, California. Okay. Number, number three coming up. That looks interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll venture another Calidris. Right. Mm -hmm. It to me looks like a uh, yes, another Calidris. And my first, uh, well, but not my my first thought was blank. Uh, like this is tough. But then looking at it, I think it's an alternate semi-palmated sandpiper. It's um, not colorful enough for a Western, which has rufous bases at the base of the scapulars, rufous in the face and the crown. I see a prominent supercilium and the bill looks pretty short to me and thick and uniform. I can see the longest tip of the tertials and the primary projection beyond that is way too short for a white rump sandpiper or Baird's for that matter. So I don't see any other possibility. That, that was my impression too. I, I I thought it was a semi p. It also has that, that sort of dark capped appearance, which might be helpful a little bit. Yes, oh. Set super silly. All good comments, and indeed it was uh, in alternate plumage. There it was photographed June first in uh, Westby, Montana, northeastern Montana. 
All right, let's go. Now, oh, <laughs> the bird I want to uh, show you is cut off by, <laughs> by Kimball on mine. These other birds are fine, but my, my quiz bird is cut off on my screen right now. I think the rest of us can see all of them. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can't. It's the lower right hand bird that I'm interested in. We can talk about the other birds, of course, but uh, the number four of this series is that bird in the lower right that I can only see about the, the last third of it. Well, here's another colliderous, I would say. <laughs> yep. Um, you can see a very long primary projection that's longer than the tail and sticks out far past the tertials. Um, very finely spotted with a fairly pale gray on the uh, breast. And then the bill is fairly short with a slight droop. And I might be imagining things, but I feel like I can see a bit of color at the base of it. That would all say white rump sandpiper to me. I think you're imagining color, Andrew. I'm trying to see that too. I agree, it's a white I rump. Can, I can. I feel like I'm in focus. We could pictures. see it. I, I the way yeah, maybe my monitor. The other two, there's two stilt sandpipers on the right, greater right. yellow lake left, and a lesser in the middle. But it's lessers with a bill like that that still caused me trouble on lone birds between greater and lesser. That doesn't look like a classic lesser yellow legs bill. But and these are all in breeding plumage or close to breeding plumage. They've got this barring on the uh, sides and flanks here and these bars coming across the, the breast. I'm not sure exactly what time of year this is, but they're either molting in or out of, of uh, breeding plumage. And I think they're molting into into formative, no, I mean into uh, into basic plumage. So that must be uh, in the in the summer or fall. But but put where Ed is. He's probably in Montana. White right. rump sandpiper is pretty regular in the spring and almost unknown in the fall, where it would be a little more worn and dark. So it's probably the spring, probably late May, at, somewhere in Montana. Well, actually, I'm but, at High Island right now in Texas. Oh, well, white rumps are equally as rare at High Island. <laughs> I was going to say any shorebird spot in uh, northeast Montana that has white rump sandpipers does not have any vegetation in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Just alkali flats. <laughs> okay, this was uh, at High Island, uh, Texas on the 27th of April. <clears throat> and uh, you nailed it very nicely, Andrew, with a uh, nice discussion of that white rump sandpiper. Well, let's go to number five then. <clears throat> there we go. It's a breeding plumage dowager, I think. Uh, <clears throat> not sure which one. Look at the scapulars. Uh, the upper parts are pretty dark, short bills are brighter, but a lot of those scapulars have distinct white tips, which is diagnostic on alternate plumaged adult dowagers. I mean, the way they contrast with the, with the black, you might see some whitish, but I see a classic long build pattern there on the uh, bars on the sides of the breasts. Yeah. And the, and the tail also is mostly dark with narrow Red white tail. bands. That's a good uh, point, Joe. Just under the primaries, you can see the outer tail feather, I think. It's mostly back black with thin white bars. Now, I can't see the tail of my screen, but uh, <laughs> let's you, you know. Well, course, just Kevin, under the price. Yeah. Okay. Kevin Carlson, of course, would love the shape of this thing. <laughs> I hate shape. <laughs> I swallowed a grapefruit or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With the barn and no spotting there, you've got it right, you guys. Uh, Long-billed Dowitcher, um, photographed on the 20th of April at Bolivar Flats in Texas. Moving on, let's see what we can find next out here. Our time is coming along pretty well. Here's number one. Well, let's start with number one. We won't go through the whole series. This is going to be kind of a potpourri of birds now. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like this one. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of non-native birds. And I'm seeing um, again, unless I'm off base, which I well could be, I'm seeing what looks from bill shape and general color to be a juvenile starling has not developed any of the distinctive uh, glossy dark and spotted plumage that we would expect. Um, the bill looks pretty conic, well, sharp and thin, but thick based and very pointed. Uh, the tail looks reasonably short compared to say a juvenile brewer's blackbird or something like that. I see a bit of brown edging on the flight feathers, which is good for starling versus uh, our native blackbirds and um, if I'm off base again, let me know, but I would have called this a juvenile starling. And it's not a dipper. <laughs> also that uh, I noticed this when I was uh, looking at some starlings this summer, uh, that their nostril is really like a large open oval that's isolated from the feathers. And uh, our native blackbirds, the nostril is more of a um, point that connects to the uh, to the feathers of the forehead. The uh, the um, possibility of female brewers blackbird uh, should be addressed a little bit. I think they usually have a much darker body and a paler head. Uh, this very uniform and more compact shape, and as uh, Kimball pointed out, the short stubby tail. I agree with uh, Starling on this one. Indeed, you're right, guys. Uh, this starling was photographed the 31st of May, so we're kicking out these young ones early, in Bozeman, Montana. Young starling. Number two. Might be an Anna's hummingbird. Agreed. It's a female hummingbird. I hate these things, because, uh, <laughs> but... Um, one thing I'm looking at is the width of all of these primary feathers here, or are they, I don't know if they're the primaries or secondaries, but I think they're primaries. And they're all the same width. And on things like black chinned and ruby throats, the inner primaries are much, much narrower, I think. Um, I was trying to remember something about the Alula on Anna's hummingbird. I think it's unusually large. Anyway, the, the uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it's the uh, the secondary coverts are like, very small right. compared to all very of the North American hummingbirds. So it makes the Alula look larger. The secondary and, coverts. No, so the, 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 the secondary are, are the secondaries are like a viridescent. You see that pet loose group of feathers? Those are the secondaries. Not a hummingbird. No, no. no. Yeah, primary the arrow right now is pointing to the secondary covers. Those are the secondaries there. Yes. Right. So, and that stack of feathers above it are the secondary covers, which are True. much shorter in relation to the secondaries in Anna's hummingbird than, as Andrew said, any of our other hummingbirds, including the congeneric Costas hummingbird. Oh, cool. And the others are about 40%. You can see the Jonathan primary. Jonathan Alderford pointed this out. Right, the two white tip primary covers, just see where they are, below and to the left of the secondaries. Well, you yeah. know, John? no, where go lower. Drop, I think- Drop the cursor down or up. Up, no, to the left Okay. and down, down. So right okay. there, you just okay. passed no, it. I, I don't want to take <laughs> the time. It's okay. above the branch. There's two little buff tips. Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah, there we go. Thankfully, I can't think of a single hummingbird where it's important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this uh, Anna's um, hummingbird was photographed on the uh, 15th of April in Alameda County. I was birding with a good friend who was a very good birder. He called it a black chin. And I says, no, I think it's an anise. And I'm glad you guys agree. It's an anise hummingbird. Okay. Black chin is red. There we go. Well, I see a 
female passerina bunting with wing bars. Uh, maybe there's a hint of blue in the tail and upper tail coverts. Um, I can see a bit of peachy buff across the breast and down the sides. <clears throat> that combined with the wing bars, and more importantly, no blurry streaks tell me it's a lazuli and not a female or a supplemental type indigo bunting. Indigos, the supplemental plumages, females always show blurred streaks below, including in winter. Female, female or supplemental lazuli bunting. I agree. All right, guys, we're moving along, doing a good job. This uh, Leslie Bunting was photographed on uh, June 4th in uh, Billings, Montana. Here's number four. Jeez. Now, this one's fun. <laughs> I feel like these white wing patches and rump are telling me a woodpecker. Yeah. Yeah, like an acorn woodpecker. Mm hmm. <laughs> You guys are good. <laughs> I had no, I had no idea. I started off at Raptor and got immediately lost. <laughs> Somebody else. Put it up. No, I, I was. Well, thinking, when you think about it, uh, I was thinking acorn. I was just going to say it. Go ahead. Yeah, or or what, Joe? Uh, I was going to say red. Thinking acorn or what? Redheaded, but that's way off because redheaded has the uh, whole secondary is white. So that, that was clearly right. out of the picture. Right. And you think about other woodpeckers with big white wing patches, like white headed doesn't have a white rump. And just by elimination, it, among North American woodpeckers, it's right. an acorn. So, of course, the better question is how would you know it's a woodpecker? And that's just gut feeling from pattern. I think you can kind of see the tips of the tail right in there, those little projections of the uh, acorn woodpecker. So that acorn woodpecker was photographed uh, on uh, May 2nd in Sacramento. All right, here's one that uh, may give us pause. Let's try number five. It might I be a pivot. Kendall will get this right. I thought it might be a, a American pivot. That's I agree. It's in breeding plumage. There, uh, the Europeans call this the buff belly pipit, and it's all like all buffy on the underparts uh, in the breeding season. We often don't see them like that until they start molting in the spring. Uh, but th that was the only thing that came to my mind. Um, I'm just going to add that I don't see it much is. in the way of streaks underneath. Maybe across the breast, so I'm, and it's such so intensely, intensely buff. I'm wondering if it could be um, in Montana, an Alticola on its way to its breeding grounds there. So I'm more, I agree, American Pippet. Now I'm focused on the subspecies. Alticola is supposed to have a longer hind claw. I can see a hind claw, but I've never tried to interpret what the difference is. Well, we're in Sacramento for one thing. Can't see the hind claw on this bird. On the right, on its left leg. No, that's that's one of the forward faces. I don't think you can see the hind toe on either foot, which is why you don't see a super long claw. Really? Looks looks like on its left foot that there's uh, the toe goes out has a long claw, which all pivots have. Never mind. If it's Sacramento, it's not Alticola, so it should be <laughs> angled. Yep. It was the 27th of March, Sacramento, Rancho Cordova, actually. So it still has some basic streaks. Well, all right. Well, you guys did well on this one. How's our time coming along here? We're, not, we're just about out of time here. Do you want to run through real quick here? I saw a note from Jen that we could go over. Do I have that wrong, Jen? Maybe just a tad, but uh, we are very close to 8 o'clock p.m., which is the ending time. Got it. The well, end of time. It's, it's hot weather out here right now, so let's cool down with the quick uh, some winter, winter happenings here. Shall we just give what we think? Yeah. Andrew. I'm going uh, <laughs> Vesper Sparrow on that. Agreed. Okay. That's, that's it Exactly. Uh, 27th, no, 21st of, um, of May, Vesper Sparrow, 
and uh, Moneda, California. Uh, Moneda, I like the Moneda. way that the, the white area wraps around the underside of the cheek. That's all. Never mind. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Next one, Savannah. Okay. Right. Savannah Sparrow. All right. Good. Nice enough. yellow lures on that one. Accipiter and an adult. Uh, I don't know. One of those Pretty two. short tailed, <clears throat> short tailed and dark hooded. I would call this a sharp shin. I, I'm not convinced. I would lean with Andrew. The cap doesn't. I see a gray cast, not black. It looks small to me. The <laughs> eyes look like they're going forward to me. You know, less bug eyed than on most sharp shins. And the the adults do have shorter tails than the than the immatures, but uh, it could I could go either way. Yeah, really heavily barred. I abstain. Too. Okay. Sharp Shin Hawk was uh, photographed on December 16th, uh, Belgrade, Montana, near Bozeman. Here's number four of the series. Hermit Thrush. Kind of like a hermit thrush. It doesn't, a have a super, doesn't have a, a super laurel line like Swainson's. There's snow on the ground where Swainson's Shouldn't be with snow. Hermit thrush is my answer. It has kind of an eye ring, thin eye ring. Yeah. Okay, again, 21 May uh, at uh, Lima, Montana. And here's number five of the series. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we got a sage thrasher. Sage thrasher. The real short billed thrasher. Long tail. Well, Okay, I'll tell you, uh, Sage Thrasher, uh, 21st of uh, May again, uh, Lima, Montana, where there's a big snowstorm that just downed all kinds of birds. Uh, Sage Thrashers, Vesper Sparrows, Chipping Sparrows, White Crowns, Brewers, all these things. Uh, they were foraging along the road, a lot of these things, and uh, trucks took care of a lot of them, unfortunately. A lot of birds were killed that day. Sad. But, what was the date? Uh, 21st of May in Montana. Oh, okay, because the wing bars are kind of worn off this one. Yeah. Well, folks, we uh, made it to 8 o'clock, and uh, that's our uh, time to, I guess, uh, let everybody get some rest. <laughs> so I'd like Thank to thank Ed. the panel for all their great help, different ideas. I think we all learn something. Uh, I always do when we uh, do this thing. And it's fun to see some spirited discussion on some of these birds. And I hope that those of you out there in the uh, audience uh, learn something. It's supposed to be educational, and I think it is. Um, Jennifer, we may have some questions. I turn it over to you. Jennifer, are you there? Yeah, there, I'm here. Um, okay. There was just one question, but it was about an, idio, uh, an issue with audio. Um, <laughs> I, I think it was because you were all talking over each other and Zoom will mute people when they hear a lot of things going on. So. I think that was the problem and it, it wasn't going on for the whole time. So um, there we go. Um, no other questions, um, but if people have questions, please put them into the Q&A and I am happy to answer them or get them answered. I'm not gonna answer them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I think we're, I think we're good. Um, We'll bring John Harris back in, and um, thank you all so much. Um, John, are you there? Oh, thank you, Ed. thank you, Ed and panelists, for a wonderful program. Um, we'll be uh, see you all tomorrow morning, bright and early at eleven o'clock. Hopefully, our opening presentation tomorrow will be given by John Dunn and Alex Cho, um, speaking on the Thule goose. So, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.